Okay, up to now we've been talking about the action of a single neuron, but now we're looking at the connection between a neuron and the, the sending neuron and the receiving neuron. We want the neuron to be sending a message to the next neuron. And this is what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is the synapse. This little area here, uh, which is the link between the terminal button of the sending neuron and the dendrite of a receiving neuron is called the synapse. And that's what that area is. So here's a close-up of the synapse. Inside you see the synapse, you see what are called vesicles. And these are like little sacs that contain neurotransmitters. These little uh, pink uh, circles represent neurotransmitters. These are special chemicals that are released into uh, this gap over here, the synaptic gap, and they bond to the receptor sites on the receiving neuron. So here is the synaptic gap, that space in between the neuron, in between the, the terminal button and the receiving neuron, and it, it's the chemicals that fill that gap. So that's what these little purple, the little pink dots represent, neurotransmitters. These are chemicals that are the chemical messengers. Remember how I said that the nervous system is an electrochemical communication system? Well, we already covered the electricity part of it. Now we're covering the chemical part of it, it's the neurotransmitters that are released. The receptor sites are where the, the neurotransmitters bond. And the neurotransmitter is a chemical that's built to uh, or rather, the receptor is built to respond to a particular kind of neuro neurotransmitter. So the uh, receptors are built to receive only some chemicals and not others. So with synaptic transmission, the electrical impulse of the action potential is converted into a chemical signal that is sent from one cell to the next. The vesicle, the, uh, the terminal button, releases the neurotransmitter into the synaptic gap. The dendrite receptor site detects the neurotransmitter. Okay. And here are the neurotransmitters. So the neurotransmitters are the chemicals that carry the information across the synaptic gap to the next neuron. As I said before, the chemical and the receptor site are, uh, or the receptor site is designed essentially to respond to specific kinds of neurotransmitters. It fits like a lock and a key. The neurotransmitter is the key, and the receptor site is like a lock, and it binds to those spots. So, if you look at here, it kind of looks like a lock and a key. The receiving neuron. Uh, you know, receives the uh, neurotransmitter, and once the neurotransmitter bonds with the uh, with the receptor, it will trigger the message that is going to be sent. So the neurotransmitter is a message telling the next cell what to do, and the neurotransmitter bonds with the receptor, essentially like a lock and a key bonding. Interestingly enough, we have a number of different drugs out there that are designed to fit into those receptor sites that are chemically similar to our own naturally produced neurotransmitters. They're similar, but not exactly the same. But nevertheless, they still can bind to those receptors. So the agonist molecule can bind with the receptor and essentially mimic the effect. Morphine is an example. Morphine, if any of you have ever been in a car accident or something like that or had to been experiencing uh, severe pain and had to go to the hospital, they might have given you morphine as a very dramatic pain, uh, uh, for pain, dramatic pain reduction. And Morphine is chemically similar 
to the naturally produced endorphins we have in our body, maybe similar, but maybe kind of like a higher uh, kick to it, but nevertheless, it is chemically similar. Therefore, the morphine binds to the receptors in our brain the same way that, or in a similar way, as our naturally produced endorphins do. So the endorphins are the neurotransmitters that bind to, as our natural painkillers. Morphine is, an, is, is, uh, is one that we use as a drug, and uh, again, it mimics the action of the neurotransmitter. On the other hand, there are some chemicals that actually bind to the receptor site, but block it. It's sort of like breaking a key off in a lock. Now the key, now the lock is useless, and the key, you can't use it anymore. So when that happens, essentially, the, any message that is going to get sent to that receptor does not get sent because that, essentially, that pathway is now gone. That pathway is blocked. So the antagonist molecules, the, the, mo the antagonists are the drugs that will, uh, will essentially block certain kinds, block certain neuro, uh, neuroreceptors. And, uh, so, as an example here, curare is a poison that paralyzes the victims. It blocks the acetylcholine receptors involved in muscle movement. So you have receptor sites in your muscle, the receptor sites that essentially stimulate your muscles to move, and those acetylcholine receptors, acetylcholine is a type of neurotransmitter, when uh, it blocks the reception of acetylcholine, well, you're paralyzed. Your muscles can't move. Another process that's going on during the, uh, in, in, in the synapse happens to after the neuron is fired, after the, uh, synap the, the, the uh, ventricle has have released the neurotransmitters into the synapse, so the message is now sent to the next cell, but now you've got a bunch of those neurotransmitters still in the synaptic gap. Well, they may bind to receptors again and start triggering the receiving neurons fire, but maybe the message has already been sent. You don't need to keep on firing. So now the process of reuptake allows the terminal branch of the uh, neuron, of the sending neuron, to bring back those neurotransmitters back into the sending neuron, getting them out of the synaptic gap, essentially shutting off the switch, shutting off the faucet for when it comes to uh, releasing neurotransmitters. So reuptake puts the brakes on. Reuptake shuts off the faucet. What happens if you prevented reuptake from happening? What would happen if you have these neurotransmitters that are in the synapse and the sending neuron doesn't bring them back. Well, they stay in the synapse, and they keep on causing that receiving neuron to fire. So in other words, it's like getting a double dose of the neural activity, getting a double dose of the message because the sending, the sender is not, is still sending out the message because the molecules, the neurotransmitters, have not been reabsorbed. Interestingly enough, there are certain kinds of drugs that inhibit the, uh, the reuptake, that essentially block the reuptake so that there's more of the neurotransmitter in the uh, synapse. An example of this would be cocaine. Cocaine inhibits the reuptake, blocks the reuptake of dopamine. Dopamine is an important neurotransmitter. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. And uh, also you may have heard of, you know, there are many types of uh, drugs for treating depression, such as Prozac, which is a category of drugs for uh, SSRIs, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, which means that the reuptake of, in this case, serotonin is blocked, and as a result, uh, 
you know, essentially it increases the serotonin action in your brain. So I mentioned the cedar corn. Cedar corn is very important. It's involved in much of action. It's also involved in learning and memory. With Alzheimer's disease, um, people have lower levels of acetylcholine. So as I said, it's important for uh, muscle movement. The botulin toxin blocks the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. This causes paralysis. With curare, similar effect, it blocks the receptors. So, botulin toxin blocks the release, curare blocks the receptors, but in both cases, acetylcholine activity is uh, stopped, and when you stop the acetylcholine activity, you have paralysis, and for eventually leading to death, because you can't paralyze the heart muscle. Or else you're going to die. Enough, another kind of toxin, another kind of poison, is black widow venom. It has action get, uh, with the acetylcholine. However, with black widow venom, it causes a flood of acetylcholine. It causes a flood of acetylcholine. What that means is now you have muscle well, you don't want it. You'll have like vibration, you'll have like tremors, you'll have like muscle, vibrant muscle contracting when you will, uh, as a result of the uh, cyclical. So what happens is, you know, the black widow uh, bites you or bites a, uh, its victim, you can have like uncontrolled muscle contractions, and it's basically not going to move, it's just going to just kind of flutter and twitch. It's not going to uh, go anywhere. Uh, so it won't be paralyzed exactly, but it'll be just like twitching. Uh, so, pretty painful. And, uh, norepinephrine is another important neurotransmitter. It's, uh, uh, people who, who like, have a lot of stress or, 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 or in a manic state, there's an increased uh, norepinephrine level. It's, it's arousing. It's involved in arousal. It's involved in keeping you pepped up. Um, Depression, actually, people with depression have lower levels of depression. So I guess, again, they're not aroused, they're not, uh, so they're, they're kind of at a low level there. I mentioned endorphins. These are natural painkillers, the natural opiate. Morphine is an opiate, heroin is an opiate, and so on. Uh, and again, you know, they, when, when the endorphins are released, it makes you feel pleasure and it also reduces your sensation of pain. Oxytocin is an important hormone and a neurotransmitter. Uh, likewise, norepinephrine also fits into that category. Um, so, with uh, oxytocin, it's related to, uh, you know, with the onset of lactation, oxytocin is released. It's also related to the bonds between the, uh, the mother and the child. So uh, it's an important neuro, uh, neurotransmitter hormone uh, for, for, certainly for mothers. I mentioned for dopamine also is very important neurotransmitter for movement, reward anticipation. So basically, when we're seeking out reward, when we're seeking out things that we want, dopamine is active and pushing us for it, it's allowing us to move towards the things that we want. Certain kinds of stimulant drugs, you know, stimulant drugs like caffeine, cocaine, and whatnot, they activate the dopamine receptors. As I said, the uh, with cocaine, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. So basically, that's what's happening. People who have schizophrenia, they kind of have like higher than normal levels of dopamine. People who have Parkinson's disease have lower than uh, lower levels of dopamine. Eventually, you know, get, as it gets worse, there's even less and less and less. And if you know people who have Parkinson's disease, they have problems with voluntary movement. Serotonin, I mentioned before as well, uh, regulates your sleep, regulates mood, which is essentially its connection with depression. 
uh, people who are, dep who are in depression have lower levels of serotonin. And Prozac, for example, increases in the level of serotonin. Why? Because it's in, it's in SSRI. It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it blocks the reuptake of serotonin, more serotonin in, uh, in the synapse, more serotonin activity uh, at the receptor site. Another important neurotransmitter is called GABA, and this is one of those inhibitory neurotransmitters. There are basically two types of neurotransmitters, inhibitory neurotransmitters and excitatory neurotransmitters. Excitatory neurotransmitters are sending a message to the next cell to fire. Sending a message to the next cell, fire your neuron, activate, go ahead. And an inhibitory neurotransmitter is a, neuro, uh, is, a, is a transmission that's saying, stop, stop releasing, stop sending messages. So it's essentially an off switch. It, is, it puts the brakes on. So GABA is one of those inhibitory neurotransmitters. Glutamate, however, is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And it has some various functions across the body, not going to go into it. Okay, so we talked about the individual neuron, we talked about the single connection between one neuron and another neuron, but we realized that our, we have billions of neurons in the body, so essentially going back to one to one, it is a little bit more complicated than that, because we have these neural networks. So you kind of know how each neuron connects with another one, but with the way neural networks work is that we're talking about clusters of neurons that work together, communicate with each other, form multiple connections. And they're complex, they grow with experience, branching out more and more. These neural networks allow us to, it improves our memory because we can make those connect, multiple connections to the things we want to remember. And so it also helps us in doing that brain damage here. If you cut off part of the neural network, the rest of it will still be around to compensate and rebuild soon. 